you need to recognize, number one, and then make a decision. Either you can feel bad about it, whine about it, cry about it, complain about it, or you can fix it. Hey there, everyone, and thanks for checking us out. It's episode 28 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Mike Chat. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as some awesome apparel and accessories, all for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you tuning in again. So don't forget our great products, like our line of lightweight sparring gear. You can find more information about our sparring gear and the rest of our products over at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a whole lot more can be found over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We put some good stuff in there, and we promise not to spam you or sell your address to anybody. So now to today's episode. On episode 28, we're joined by Mr. Mike Chat, a lifelong martial artist and the founder of XMA. Mr. Chad has succeeded in nearly all the ways a martial artist could ever hope to, from competition to movies, television, and business. Despite all of his success, Mr. Chad stays incredibly humble, and throughout this episode, he's constantly giving credit to those around him. I have no doubt that there's a lot more in store for this man. And so with that, Mr. Chad, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. It's an honor to have you on the show. And of course, I know a lot about you from some of your time on camera, and I'm sure a lot of the audience does as well. But what I'm going to guess a lot of us don't know is how you got started in the martial arts. So why don't, why don't you go way, way back and tell us how that got going? Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in the Chicagoland area, and my dad and I used to watch on Sundays Samurai Sunday. It was one channel. I don't even remember what it was, but all day Sunday from the time I woke up till, you know, dinner time, they had Kung Fu movies. And so, you know, the, the, the Sunday morning routine was to get up, do the yard work, or do the yard work. Um, if we went to church that day, we did that if it wasn't Saturday night. And then it was, it was sit down, Samurai Sunday, ramen noodles for lunch. And it was like martial arts movie marathon. And so that was it. Ever since I can remember, we used to watch those films. And that's all I wanted to do was just be able to do martial arts like that, fly through the air with weapons and do a million kicks and land in those super cool poses. So that's that's how I got started. And, you know, it was years of that. And then my parents said, okay, when, when you're eight years old, you can start. They thought, I think they thought that I would forget about it or lose interest because they thought it was too dangerous. They didn't want me doing it. So eight years old, I was like, that's what I want for my birthday. And we enrolled. Cool. So did your, was there any martial arts in your family? Was there, was this something that you shared with your, your, I think you said your dad, like, you know, what was the connection there? Actually, my dad was a martial art movie fan. He did some Muay Thai because my parents, uh, well, we're Chinese Thai mix, but uh, grandparents moved from China to open rubber plantations in Thailand. And so my dad grew up, he did some Muay Thai, um, but he wasn't practicing, you know, once he came to the United States. And he was just, he was just a martial club movie fan. So that was it, really. No other, no other prior okay. history. But you, you probably picked that up from him, Leo, your, you know, your career, at least in part to his training, his love of the arts. Absolutely. I'm going to guess. Cool. Okay. So here you are, you get started, you're eight years old, you've been training for quite a long time now. You've done a lot. You've done a lot of great stuff. You've had the type of martial arts career that most of us would only dream of. And I'm sure you've got an absolute ton of stories, great stories. (laughs) But if I had to force you to pick one and tell us, what would it be? Uh... That's easy. The, the, the most, most memorable story that stands out in my mind is when my managers at the time were working with, you know, the legendary Sammo Hung. And he came to the United States to work on CBS's martial law. He had his own TV show. Well, I had the honor and opportunity to meet him 
work with him. He liked me. His son was here. Uh, uh, another guy that was doing stunts on the show was here with him. So I actually got to train with him. And he trained me to double him on the show. And wow. so it was, it was literally, I was living the dream. I was living what I used to watch on TV. What does every Kung Fu movie have in it? It's, you know, Kung Fu fighting, and then they would, like, eat and prepare meals. And so yeah. <laughs> while, while we were training, no kidding, while we were training in Samo's living room or in his backyard, he would be cooking and preparing lunch. And it was dumplings and noodles and soup and, like, but it was just, it was like a movie. And then he would, he would either yell out the window or he, he would come out and say, okay, okay, you know, very good. Okay, now try this one. And then he would give us another move or stunt ball or reaction to do. And it was four hours of training and then we would eat lunch every day for a month to prep for filming for the show. So I literally got to live out my dream. And what, what was so interesting is that, you know, I'm a huge Hong Kong, you know, film fan myself. And so I grew up watching Jackie Chan, Samuel Hong, Yin Yu. And then fast forward many years later, here I am, you know, being trained by Samo and he's literally cooking me food. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> That's got to be quite a surreal moment to be in Samo Hung's backyard and practicing oh, yeah. movements he's given you and have him yell through the window that lunch is ready. Yeah. Did, did you have moments where you just kind of looked around and thought, is this really happening? Is this a dream? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, we would drive there. And then there was a point where I had a student with me who was also he was competing at the time, Guy Burkett. And, uh, you know, Samo said, he, he was staying with me for the summer and training. And Samo said, yeah, bring Guy. So, so I had a student with me as well who got to experience it, which was like, wow, amazing. So, uh, yeah. And, and you, know, <laughs> you know, the best part is there's, there's this hot sauce. That camo love. And he's like, oh, he's like, he's like, Michael, this one, it's the best one. <laughs> and he would always, he would always bring different hot sauces. And he's like, no, 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 but this one's the best one. <laughs> and then, and then he would run out of the hot sauce and it was always about trying to get that one specific hot sauce. So, uh, do you remember yeah, what kind it was? was? Uh, Yank Sing hot sauce. There's a famous restaurant. In, in San Francisco called Yang Sing and they have their own hot sauce and okay. and that's the one it was cool. yeah, and so I if, if you if I go to my cabinet right now I've got two jars of hot Yang Sing hot sauce in my cabinet if, if you go to XMA in the cabinet and XMA we've got, we've got a jar of Yang Sing hot sauce <laughs> and it's like it's, it's like the family favorite For yeah sure. so is it really the best Absolutely. I mean, for, for, for us, I mean, the flavor is, yeah, great. Yeah, There's many, cool. many great hot sauces, but this, this one is outstanding. Awesome. I'll have to see if I can find it over here on the East Coast. Yank Sing. They have it in, um, like here they have 99 Ranch Market. They have it in many, many different uh, Asian markets. But I, I don't okay. know if it's, if it's distributed out there, but it's quite popular. Okay. Well, I'll... I mean, this will be the first hot sauce to make it into the show notes, but I'll see if I can find it and post the link for everyone. There you go. <laughs> well, that, that's a great story. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of our guests tell stories that I sit here and, and I'm a, a bit envious of, but that's certainly one. Cause I remember that show. I remember watching martial law with my mom when I was a kid. And oh yeah. I'd started martial arts by that point, but just, you know, I remember he was, a legitimate martial artist and he was on TV and had a series and you could see the realism and the, you know, the technical accuracy of what he was doing. And mm -hmm. that's what I remember being away by. So that's pretty great that you, you got to train with him for sure. Yeah. So you've had a lot of paths, a lot of maybe tangents through the martial arts and you, you're, you're at a, you know, pretty amazing place right now with what you're doing with XMA and traveling. And, and I'm sure you're doing a lot of traveling. I see on social media, you're bouncing around. Yeah. But how would you say the martial arts has impacted you as a, as a person? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's like a general question. Um, 
Yeah. Martial, martial arts is my life. Um, I don't know what I would be doing without martial arts. It was something that ever since I can remember was in, it was in my mind because of the movies that I watched with my father. And so it's just, it's just part of me. So everything from, you know, uh, you know, we tell, we tell our students this. Parents bring their kids to martial arts so that way they can get strong physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially. We teach that now in our leadership programs. And so in every aspect from, from the way, you know, uh, how I prepare for my day the night before, you know, it's very martial, it's structured, it's organized, it's uh, militaristic, right? And then, you know, to how I run my business, um, you know, deal with people, you know, there, there's a mix of everything. That, that we do. It's not just about kicking and punching, obviously. You know, it truly is a way of life and then, and then how we not, not just improve and better ourselves, but then how we affect other people. You know, that's our awareness, you know, then our society and our community and then, you know, the world around us. It's just, you know, it just extends out. You know, everything that we do in martial arts starts from the inside, goes to the outside, whether it's a technique and we're preparing or we're, you know, uh, you know, showing, you know, self-esteem and confidence in ourselves and our ability to then help others or train others or, or lead others. And it always goes from the in to the outside. So, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's something that, you know, is, is probably the most important, you know, part of what we do. Self-development and then helping others. Great. So... I can't imagine that your life has been all roses. You know, we, we all go through tough times. We all have rough points. And I'm wondering if you'll share one of those with us and how your foundation in the martial arts helped you move through it. Absolutely. So um, to make this one, <laughs> to make this one a, a, a quick one, because it, uh, it, it was a very low point in my life. Uh, I had created XMA, married two kids, you know, the house, cars, you know, living the life and doing very, very well. Just moved back from New York City, you know, sold our condo there. And, um, and then I went through a divorce. And mm. it was, it was one of those things where we had mutually decided that, you know, okay, we had been married for, for 15 years. And we tried many different things and we were very diligent about trying to resolve our issues. And we, you know, had been friends, you know, for three quarters of our lives at that point. And so, you know, we decided maybe there's another way. And, you know, we're both very, very creative. And so we decided, well, maybe being together wasn't the best way to do this, raising up our kids, the businesses, everything, because everything was together. So yeah. we decided to go down a different path. And at that moment, it was, it was all about, you know, you know, my failure, failure as a partner, failure as a husband, failure as a leader to be able to keep everything else going and together in my life. But yet my own personal life, I couldn't keep that together. And I couldn't structure that. I couldn't find the balance. You know, everything in martial arts that we do, I was not doing in my personal life. It was totally out of balance. And, um, you know, we, we had both recognized that, that, uh, we had goals and that we wanted to take risks and make sacrifices. But I did not have the foresight to see that even though we both agreed on, okay, we're going to sacrifice this in order to go after this. Then, um, you know, that's what threw things out of balance. And I was not you know, experienced enough to see those things coming. So, uh, for me, that was, that was very difficult. The martial arts helped me to realize that even though this was not conventional, even, you know, it was not conventional to then, you know, give up, right? What do we say in martial arts? Never give up, persevere, right. you know, uh, you get knocked down, you, you know, the failure is not when you get knocked down, it's when you refuse to get back up or refuse to keep on going. So everything in my mind, you know, about going down the path of divorce was contradictory to everything that I believed in and everything that I taught in my life. And so coming to terms with that was very difficult, as you can imagine. And then 
realizing through my martial arts and, and my position as a leader was that, well, the divorce rate was already 50% in, in the United States at the time. In Los Angeles, it had crept up to over 75% of people were getting divorced. And so maybe there was a new way, a new opportunity to lead and to show that, you know what, I can still be a leader for those who are married, those who uh, had gotten divorced, those who are thinking about it by leading in a very positive way. My ex-wife and I wound up after eight months of mediation. Uh, we were able to work out the majority of our issues that we could not through marriage. Uh, we were able to work them out through divorce, and we work very well together. Uh, her picture still hangs, you know, uh, in inside XMA to this day. You know, she's one of the, the co-founders of, of the XMA World Headquarters. Um, you know, her name appears on our website, and as the co-founder, I give her credit, honor her as my former partner and, the, you know, the mother of my two kids. And, uh, you know, we're doing it. Like, our our lives are very, you know, uh, simple and smooth in that way. We work very well together and support each other in that way. And, you know, we are able to be very, very strong role models for others. So um, that's how the martial arts helped me through that. But that, and as you can imagine, being a leader and saying all of these things about, you know, perseverance and never giving up and, you know, finding solutions, you know, to have to go through that, for me, that was that was the, the most difficult moment in my life. Mm. That's some pretty heavy stuff, and I, I want to thank you for being so open and sharing that. Now, is there? Do you think there's a lesson in there for people that that, that people could apply to their broader life? You know, about transitioning uh, what might initially look like a failure to something else. Absolutely, I, I wouldn't necessarily apply this to marriage because that's very complicated. But but the, the saying that. You know, insanity is doing is doing the same thing over and over and over, expecting a different result. And at one moment, you know, it's all about having that self awareness and recognition. When you recognize that something is not changing, then you need to recognize number one, and then make a decision. Either you can feel bad about it, whine about it, cry about it, complain about it, or you can fix it. That's it. You have two, you have two choices because if you want to feel bad about it, go ahead. See where that gets you, right? Or you work for fixing it. And surely the moment that you put your mind to finding the solution, it starts, it starts to explore all of these different avenues. And then you start talking to people, you put it out there in the universe, you start getting feedback and, 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 and help and direction and guidance in ways that you never imagined. But, but when, when you're still stuck in that mode of feeling bad, whining, complaining about things, it's such a negative state of mind that you close yourself off to the possibility of getting out of that place mentally and physically. So, so number one, it would be just recognition. And most people don't have the awareness to just recognize that they're in this pattern or they're in this negative state. You know, even when people tell them, they deny it. They go into that denial phase first. You're like, what are you talking about? No, I'm not. No, I don't. And and coming to terms with that is the most difficult thing. So really, really being aware. And and then from there, there's a chance, you know, that you can change what's happening in your life. So you've had your, your hands, your feet, figuratively and literally, around a lot of great people. But if you had to pick one of them that you would say was the most influential for your martial arts training, who might that be? Oh, that's my instructor, Sensei Sharky, for sure, without a doubt. He's, uh, he was like a second father to me, and he is the reason why I was able to do everything in my martial arts life. Um, he supported me. He basically, you know, if I wasn't home, he was the one that was raising me and mm. uh, provided me with opportunities and, you know, trained me, created the community of support around me, you know, from the moment I started training with him to, you know, even when I left for college and I was out in California, um, you know, he's been, he's been an integral part of my life. You know, he's my oldest son's godfather. Uh, you know, we, we have, I actually, I just did an event for him at his school. 
Sunday. And, yeah. um, you know, after being in Detroit and then I flew to Chicago and, and I was with him for a day, um, you know, by far, I, I owe everything that I've ever done in my life, starting at nine years old when I started to train with him, mm-hmm. you know, to him. He is, he is the single most important person, you know, outside of my parents that has helped me. Wow. That's, you sound pretty fortunate that this was the gentleman that you started with, Absolutely. that you started your training with. I, you know, a lot of the guests that we have on the show bounced around that they eventually, a lot of us find that person, that person that not only yeah. is an instructor, but is so foundational and so transformational. Yeah. But we don't all have the luck of starting with them. So that's fantastic. And even more so that you're still in touch with that, that man is still in your life. Absolutely. It's, I, 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 an honor. I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky to have him. You know, we're, we are family. And, uh, I mean, I have many mentors in my life. Um, but without him, nothing would have been possible. You know, I have, you know, I work with the uh, American Taekwondo Association and Century Martial Arts, um, many organizations. But like in the ATA, uh, Chief Master Clark is the one who brought me into the ATA. There would be no XMA ATA Extreme without Chief Master Clark. And then mm-hmm. my current, my current partner, Chief Master Von Schmeling. You know, I would not have XMA and Victory Life Skills and our leadership program without without my current partner, Chief Master Lam Schmeling. Without my dealer at Century, there would be no XMA. He's the one that, that we partnered with to even create the Extreme Martial Art Program. So my dealer, uh, David Wall, Frank Silverman, uh, the director of Maya, uh, Mike Metzger over at Maya, these guys, you know, these guys are the reasons why, you know, you even know about XMA. <laughs> so, right. you know, but yes, it all started with Sensei Sharky and then, and then from then on, now I have many, many people in my life that helped to mentor me and lead me. So, um, you know, my chances of, of doing well are much greater than most, you know, because I have so many great people in my life to help me, but yeah, I, I definitely feel very grateful and fortunate to have them. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that any of us that have done anything in our life, if we look really hard, if we're honest with ourselves, that success came because of the support of other people. And I like the way you put it, that yeah. you, you're you more likely to be successful because you've had so many wonderful people at your back. Yeah, for sure. It's so many people, and we, you know, we, we, we talk to school owners, and I was like, okay, so who are you working with? Who's your mentor? Blah, blah, blah. Most people don't have one. Or they have one, and and maybe that's in business, or maybe they have a martial art instructor, but they don't have a mentor of business. And you know, I have I have many mentors that help me in you know my personal life, you know, with my family, business, uh, martial arts training, um, you know, and so uh, financially. And then when you have people that can help guide you, that know much more, that are that are at a higher level, then it just it just allows you better chances of doing the things that you want to do, reaching the levels that you want because you have guidance versus, I mean, can you imagine, you know, it's like the people that go on YouTube and uh, they're, they're trying to learn martial arts on their own from random people on YouTube versus actually mm. having someone there that they can go train with and communicate and interact with, you know, to actually learn in person. Much different. That, that's a great comparison and it's one that I hope those people that are listening, you know, those of you out there that are school owners that are, you know, even outside of martial arts that have businesses will take that advice to heart because it really, really makes sense. All the coaches that I have have coaches. Yeah, for sure. For sure. (laughs) Even at the highest level, when you go to the Olympics, Olympic athletes, they have coaches standing right there next to them while they, while while they compete, you know, and you know, the most successful business people in the world, they all have mentors and coaches. So, yeah, in every happen. area of life, people have them. So let's talk about your time in competition. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of guests that we have on the show that, you know, I can say, oh, did you ever compete? You know, of course, I know you competed. I know you were pretty successful. And, I, you know, a lot of what you've done has come out of the connections, I'm sure, that you made competing. But rather than just run down a list of your accomplishments, what was it about competition that you loved? What I loved about competition was pushing myself, challenging myself. And um, that's really, 
the, the biggest benefit of, of, of competing is to test your boundaries, to test your limits, and, you know, to do it for yourself. People that do it for others, their dad, their mom, their family, their friend, you know, ultimately, ultimately, there's a point where you just cannot push yourself, you know, to the level, to the highest level when, when it's not personal to you. And so for me, it was all about, you know, challenging myself to the highest level because I wanted it. I wanted, I wanted to see how far I could take. I wanted to see how many times I could win in how many places, um, all over the world and, um, you know, how many years in a row. So I mm. competed for 13 years nonstop. Um, none of the competitors that I competed against that, that became famous along with me and, and, uh, are known in the martial arts world to have been part of the beginning of extreme forms and, and, uh, competition in that way. Uh, none of them competed straight through. They all took a break at some point, one, two to three years off, and then they came back as adults. But, uh, I just kept doing it because I loved it. And, and that's, that's why, you know, I became so good. And that's why, you know, I was able to use it for so many other things in my life. What do you think was different about your approach or your attitude that you were consistent for 13 years? I believe I, I just, I just loved it. I loved it. So I wanted to do it. And then, and then my instructor created a community and an environment. Um, and along with my parents had the same philosophy. So I was getting this support from all the people around me where, um, where it was all about, you know, pushing yourself to reach the highest level, never giving up, working hard, going after the things that you want in life, you know, by earning them. And, you know, when, when, when you don't win, when you fall short, you go back, you know, you work harder and then you try again. And so, it, you know, it was never about, it was never about, you know, uh, do I want to take a break? It was always about how far do I want to take it? And so there was never an ending point for me. It wasn't, okay, I'm going to do this for two more years and take a break. It was always about how far do I want to take it? And it was about, mm. okay, well, when I'm done competing as a junior, then I want to do the same thing as an adult. Like, I couldn't wait to get to the adult division. At 16, because it was 16, 17, and then at 18, you go to adult. At 16 years old, I wanted to jump to the adult division. And Why? I wanted to start competing as an adult. Well, because I was, I was already winning, you know, and, um, you know, number one in the 16, 17 year old division at 16. And then, you know, winning most of the tournaments, not all of them, but most of them. And so I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to compete against adults because I thought I could beat them. You know, looking back now, I realized that, uh, no, <clears throat> um, I wasn't good enough to beat most of the adults, but my mindset was so strong and my, my training was so, so good for my, my instructor and my, my peers that they trained me and taught me and my parents taught me, you know, that I could do whatever I wanted to do. All I had mm. to do was set my mind to it. So in my mind, I thought I could beat all these adults. Um, and then fast forward the first year of competition, I had a rude awakening and I lost the first tournament and, uh, that motivated me. I lost the second, hit, the third, the fourth, the fifth tournament. And then the wow. sixth tournament of the year, the U.S. Open, I won. And I won the whole tournament. And it was amazing. And I beat all of the adults. I don't know how. I did. And then for the rest of the year, I lost every other tournament. Every <sighs> single one. So for me, you know, coming up as an adult, you know, thinking that I was going to be, you know, the number one guy and it was going to be such a smooth transition, you know, the reality was, that even though I thought and I knew that I could, the reality was I wasn't good enough. Um, but that made me work so hard that in year two, you know, it was much, much, much better. But, uh, you know, that was a result of my parents, my upbringing, and my instructor and the community that they created for me. So I know it's going back a couple of years, but what what was your emotional state like coming off of being such a dominant competitor 
in the youth divisions. And then that first year, you know, other than the U.S. Open, not performing to the level that you were used to. What, what was it like being 18, which, you know, I was an 18-year-old guy once. A lot of the yeah. audience was an 18-year-old was man once. You know, we, we tend to have a fair amount of ego at that point. Oh, uh, let's see here. You can you can interview Chris Kosimov for next. And, uh, and you can ask him how I was. I would describe myself as um, humble and respectful, like one percent of the time, and then and then uh, arrogant and cocky and way overconfident the rest of the time. And okay. and although I was. I was extremely respectful to people, to those who I was competing against that I wanted to be. I was not so, I was not so nice. And, and, um, and it was motivating to me. It was frustrating and motivating, but, uh, it wasn't until after I won the U.S. Open and then I lost again. You know, I, I remember thinking back, I'm like, okay, how could I just win the whole U.S. Open tournament and then lose right after and then lose again and then lose again. Like maybe, maybe I'm not doing something right. Maybe they're doing something that's much better than I am. Like I need to figure this out real fast because I don't like losing. And so, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a tough transitional year for me, but you know, extremely humbling. And, and what I would like to say is Chris Casamasa and I, are, are good friends. We've kept a great relationship over the years. Fast forward, we went on to do WMEC Masters together. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we're both from Los Angeles. So, you know, I've been out to his black belt testing to help support his, his people. Um, you know, we've worked together on ESPN doing commentary for the US Open. We have a great relationship. And, you know, I've told him, I said, you know, uh, you know, I apologize for, you know, being such a punk kid when, when I was 18. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we put that behind us, but yeah, yeah, I remember, you know, calling them out and say, you better be ready. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I look back now and it's like, oh my gosh, what, what an idiot I was. <laughs> 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 but we all have those, <clears throat> excuse me, we all have those moments, I guess. Um, I just, yeah, I just had it at that stage of my life. Yeah. Wow, that's you know that wasn't quite where I expected you to go with all that, but I'm I'm glad that you did, and I think it gives all of us some some different perspective, and it makes where you're at now that much more incredible. Because mm-hmm. you you sure. don't have a have that kind of reputation, you know, throughout the martial arts community, and right. and through none of our conversations, you know, on this call now, and and when we've spoken prior, have I gotten even a lick of that. Mm-hmm. In speaking to you, yeah, so it no. sounds like you flipped that ninety nine percent, one percent around. Yes, that was a brief one year. Hopefully, it wasn't a year. Maybe it was just six or eight months in that year. But yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I admit it. I, I'm coming clean. I, I had that moment. That's for sure. <laughs> the confession segment of martial arts radio. Mm-hmm. So, if there's somebody that you could train with that you didn't get to that, you know, or, or haven't yet, maybe is a better way to put it, you know, and we'll even open that up. Somebody that's passed on or, or someone that is still alive, who would you want to train with? Well, that's easy. You know, all, all of the great martial artists that have come in the past, uh, you know, from you know Bruce Lee to now, because I work so heavily with the American Taekwondo Association, uh, the eternal grandmaster H. G. Lee, uh, I've become very, very close with his son, uh, Master Taekwon Lee. And, you know, he built this organization, a, a master coming from Korea, you know, Omaha, Nebraska, started with one little school. And fast forward 40 years later, there's over 1,400 schools around the world, over 250,000 know, members worldwide. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason, you know, that, uh, you know, one man, Along with his partner at the time, uh, Master Richard Reed, uh, they created this organization from nothing, and it has grown, and it has, you know, withstanded the test of time, even long after he's passed, you know, the organization is still growing. 
So, you know, that, that would be someone that I would love, you know, if I could go back and, you know, spend a moment, an hour training with somebody, it would be them. Mm. That's a great answer. So now to some of the, the, the lighter questions that we have. Those are all pretty heavy. I'm sure you're a movie guy. You've been in movies, so you've got to be a movie guy. Do you have a favorite martial arts film? Well, I would... <laughs> I, I have to say, gosh, you know, you know that's like the toughest question to ask a martial artist. Um, Absolutely. That's but, why it's the most fun. You know, I, I just have to say, of course, Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan. I, I had eight of my students do films with Jackie. Not just stunts, but actually have roles wow. in his films. Uh, oh, cool. Jackie Chan, huge, huge fan. Uh, you know, Jet Li grew up on the one upon a time in China, China movies. Um, uh, but I have this personal relationship with Sammo Hung. And, and I have to say that the, the, my favorite movie uh, in martial arts is Pain and Case. And he's done so many, you know, many great movies and lots of second directing and, and choreography for Jackie. But Pain and Cases was the film that he did where he plays the director of the Peking Opera. And mm. He trains, you know, in the movie, it's him, Samo, or him, Jackie, and Yun Byu in the Peking Opera, and Samo plays the director, but, but I experienced some of the Peking Opera training when I was training with Samo in his backyard. So mm. when he showed me that movie, that, that was the most meaningful to me because, you know, of, you know, his role in my life and training me and then seeing how he trained in a taking opera with Jackie and Yambu. Cool. So would, would you say he's your favorite actor? Sam Martial arts actor? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, you yeah. know, I love Jackie and Jed and now of course, you know, Donnie Yen. I mean, there's so many mm. great, you know, amazing you know, martial artists and, you know, Hitman man three is coming out and, and uh, right. Sam was in the trailer. So of course, you know, super excited to see that. Um, you know, because you, you, know, you know who else is in that? It. Who? You know who else is in that trailer that that's kind of got some people pumped up? Oh, Mike Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. <laughs> 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 well, I, I don't have any personal connection to him. I'm sure there's many people that are fans, but um, yes, yeah, Sam, Sam, and Donnie, and you know, for sure, they're uh, they're big ones for me. It's going to be a great movie. I'm I'm really excited for it for sure. How about how about books? Any any inspirational books or educational books? Anything martial arts related you'd recommend to us? Well, when you say martial arts related books, um, I think there's many books out there that are that are important for for martial artists to read. So you know, if you ask any successful business person then, you know, they're going to say what? They're going to say, you know, Dale Carnegie probably went to and influence people. Um, the greatest salesman in the world, you know, seven high habits of highly effective people. Um, you know, everything from, you know, uh, Spencer Tracy, Jack Welch books, um, you know, Larry Widget, he's a good one. Uh, you know, the Bible, just understanding, you know, the Bible and many things that come out of that. So, how does that apply to martial artists? It's because, you know, martial artists, you know, it, you train in martial arts and it's supposed to be a lifestyle. So living the lifestyle that you want also involves how to get the things that you want in life. So being happy with the people that are around you socially and then what you do for your work, you know, to make money in your career, you know, how you are with your family. And then, you know, in the end, what is it that you want to pass on when, when, when you're done, you know, from, for, for people, it's either, you know, money or it's legacy. You know, most martial artists would agree that it's not necessarily about money. It's about leaving a legacy behind. And so, you know, how to treat people and how to navigate through this world, I think is very important. So, um, you know, those are the books that stand out in my mind. And, you know, obviously because I, I, I am an entrepreneur and have businesses and, have very successful people around me in that way, then those would be the go-to books that, that I would I would start with. 
versus any martial art based book. Okay. Those are great books. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll have those listed out at, uh, at the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Mm-hmm. So what's keeping you going? Do you have any goals, anything driving you towards more success? <laughs> well, that, that would what are you be reaching entirely, for? that would be an entirely uh, separate interview if you wanted to talk about <laughs> all, all of the different goals that I have. Um, <laughs> but what, what's in the immediate future is uh, our expansion here in Los Angeles with our schools. We just opened up our, our second uh, XMA Victory location out in the Gora Hills. We've got our world headquarters here, so that's, that's the second location, and we're looking to do many more. Um, on the entertainment side, there's some acting projects and, and projects that, that I'm in the process of uh, developing and producing. And then long term, you know, the goal is to just continue uh, to spread martial arts and, and to help schools better their business, work more professionally, so that way we can continue to create positive impact and you know, in our students and our communities, but really grow. You know, the, the martial arts industry is struggling right now and has been for the last you know, 10 years. And, you know, more schools are closing than are opening. And it's because martial artists, you know, they, the natural progression is to teach, but martial artists are not business people. And so many of them open up schools, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but they're not necessarily uh, versed in business. And then when they go to do the business, you know, they don't enjoy it and they just want to teach, but they cannot just teach because they have to run the business. And then that's where there's a disconnect and a breakdown. And then they struggle and then they eventually have to close or sell their school. So yeah. you know, we're, we're really focused on helping school owners learn how to one, better teach what they're teaching. And then two, you know, learn how to, how, how to run a business, you know, with it because you know, many martial artists, especially traditional ones, you know, they feel bad charging for what they're teaching. You know, they don't, they don't feel that they should be compensated well. You know, they feel they should just be compensated, but not well. And, you know, it, it's a mindset that we have, but, you know, we, we have more students and more people, you know, than many, many doctors. You know, many, yeah. many people that are out there, we, we help them in so many ways and we give, we're in touch and in communication with them on a much more consistent basis. And, and we do really great work. And so, you know, we're in a re-education phase right now with the industry, you know, to get them on board with seeing themselves as highly valued and then being able to charge for their services so that way they can do what they love. Because if they cannot attract new students and keep them, then they will not be able to teach martial arts for a living. They'll have to do it on the side. And um, and that's okay, but many, many martial artists want to be able to do this for a living. And there's a way to do it. You know, so that that's our mission is to really help school owners and martial artists do what they love if that's what they want to do for their career. Those are wonderful goals, absolutely. And and if people want to follow you or learn more about how they can do that, how how would they do that? How would they stay in touch with you? And uh, they can always get contact. Yeah, they can contact me directly. Um, uh, my email address, I'm sure you'll put it up, chat at xmahq.com. They can type, you know, you type in XMA in any search engine, you know, you, you'll be able to find us. Through our social media channels, we post a lot of things. And what many people don't realize is that pretty much anything you want to learn in martial arts, technique-wise, forms, weapons, tricks, acrobatics, you can learn on YouTube for free. You can get it all for free already. If you look, our social, if you look at our social media posts, You'll see what we do at events, and you'll see how we do it. You can just top it. We post it for a reason. One, to highlight the students, and two, for other people to see what we're doing, and then just copy it. Mm. Like we just posted you know, a video from, from uh, the last event, and we did a balloon drop. And inside the balloons were discount coupons. Why did, why did I post the balloon drop? Like, What relevance does that have in a martial art event? Well, it's because cause we, help, you know, we help schools generate revenue so that way they can reinvest it in training in their in their instructors, buy new equipment, update their facilities. That's important. Is it about the money in that moment? Yes. It's about generating cash, but why? It's not about the money. It's about reinvesting and bettering the services that we offer. So, you know, it is and it isn't about the money, but just having a better understanding and just to show the excitement of how 
how students get so excited just by dropping balloons from the ceiling. It's crazy how excited they get. And then they yeah. walk away having such a great experience. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Is there anything wrong with having your students walk out of a school so excited, you know, saying, wow, that was amazing. That was the best event ever. And then they want to go home and practice, and they, they, they're so excited to come back to class the next week. Nothing wrong with that. And so, you know, that's why we do things like that. So even just following, you know, follow, follow me on Twitter, you know, my, you know, at my chat, and, you know, at uh, XMA chat for Instagram, on my Facebook page, and, and then just watching what we do. Sure, if you want to go to another level and actually, you know, uh, you know do trainings with us, you know, then, then absolutely. We have trainings all over the world. You know, I'm going to Europe in, in, in a couple of weeks, and I'll be in Barcelona with Nick Busca, Lisbon, uh, Portugal, Germany, Italy, and, uh, you know, we're, we're out there helping people. So, you know, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's in, you know, Orlando, Florida, whether it's internationally, there's always the opportunities, whether it's with myself, with my partner, um, the ATA, there's, there's great opportunities out there now for education. Good, absolutely. And of course, everything that you just mentioned, your Twitter account, Instagram, email address, those are all going to be over at the show notes. So no worries if anybody's listening and they, they're scrambling to write that stuff down. Yeah. So as we finish up, any parting advice for those listening? Any parting advice? Yes. I would say we talk about this all the time. You know, if you think you can't and if you think you can, you're right. Focus on, you know, we say focus 5% on the problem, 95% on the solution, right? Acknowledge things for what they are, not worse than they are. And when there's a problem, when there's a mistake, when you fall down, you know, when you get to that point in life, physically, mentally, you know, emotionally, whatever it is, you know, you have two choices. You can either feel bad about it or you can fix it. And, and, and that's it. If you look at it in, you know, in, in black and white terms, it makes it so much easier. You know, it's when, when, when you complicate things by overthinking it, then, then it makes it really difficult. So whatever, is, whatever the goal is that you have, whatever it is that you want in life, just focus on that. And when there's a problem, when there's a challenge, just keep focusing on what you want. Talk to people, you know, uh, find people that can help lead you and mentor you. Um, you know, put it out there to the universe and just keep focusing on it, you know, and then, you know, as long as you have, you know, beliefs and you have strong people around you to help support you, then, you know, you can, you can achieve the things that you want, whether that's happiness, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, a competition goal or, you know, anything else, then just keep focusing on the things that you want and going after them and, uh, you know, find people to help you. Don't, don't try and do everything on your own. That's the most difficult part, trying to do it on your own. Very well said and an excellent point to end on. So I, I really appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to episode 28 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and a big thank you to Mr. Chat. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would make a big difference. It's those reviews that help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com and you'll get a free thank you pack, including some great stuff. Maybe some shirts, stickers, water bottles. We're not going to promise quite what's in it, but it'll be great and we're going to pay the shipping on it. Please don't forget to tell your friends about the show. Word of mouth is really what's helping this show grows and your help is appreciated. You can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And check out the great stuff we have here at Whistlekick. Gear, shirts, pants, and a whole lot more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.